Fairy Tale by Stephen King. My apologies for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. And of course, also, my allergies are very bad today. So I had a hard time getting started. But it looks like we are on the go now. We're ready to rock. We're, we're going to continue on with our reading of Stephen King's fairy tale. If you can recall, uh, our hero, Charlie, is in, of course, in the world of Impis and in, I guess, the palace. I've got the name of this palace or town that he's in, uh, where that used to be a kingdom. Uh, but he is now about to confront Hannah, the monster that he needs to get past in order to get to the sundial that will help his dog to heal. His, his dog is dying of old age, and he's very sentimentally attached to this dog, and he has made it his mission to, in this world of impis, heal his dog, save his dog. And of course, in the process, we can only assume that he will also save this town, you know, this, this whole world, which has been somehow cursed by some evil entity that has taken over this, this kingdom. And and uh, cast out uh, the the royalty of the kingdom, who was uh, uh, Leah, uh, who uh, cursed her with uh, uh, with having no mouth, and, and I think it was Woody who was cursed with having no ear, no eyes, and then there was uh, Claudia who was cursed with having no ears. So they could not, they, one could not see, one could not hear, and one could not speak. Uh, but they had found other ways to get around that. And so now he, we can only assume that will, he will, uh, in facing Hannah, this horrible monster, and in facing and, and helping his dog, he will also somehow save this world of impis from the, I guess, the, the destruction or the horror that they now face. So I don't want to waste too much time talking on this. We understand how this is going. Uh, I believe this chapter, we're up to chapter 18. And with this chapter, we will no longer be we will, after this, no longer be promoting this book club. Uh, we'll no, no longer be inviting people to join. Uh, basically, we're just going to continue on reading this and having this on record as something that we have done uh, that's recorded as a live stream on YouTube. And that will be available on our website, realenglishparty.com. And um, it's something that people can use if they like, if they, they can encounter. But for the most part, this will be my book club that no one has joined and uh, no one is invited to join at this point. We're going to continue to the end of this book and then at that time start something new. So here we are at chapter 18. Uh, if you're watching this, you can leave questions, you can leave comments. Uh, do feel free to like uh, if it's possible. Also, you can share. I don't understand really why anyone would want to see this that is not involved in this book club with you, but certainly you can share it. Of uh, this is not a uh, this is no longer something that we're trying to profit from. So you, you you're no longer invited to join after this event, but certainly you're invited to watch along, and uh, and uh, and you can leave comments and you can ask questions, and we'll be sure to try to answer those as we can see them. Uh, so that's what's going on for now, and let's continue. We're we're reading chapter eighteen, Hannah. Pinwheel Paths, The Horror in the Pool, The Sundial at Last, An Unwelcome Encounter. So, of course, the title of this chapter tells us quite a bit what's going to happen, I think. So let us begin. Hannah must have come out when the rain stopped, perhaps to savor the brightening day. She was sitting on an enormous golden throne below a striped awning of red and blue. I didn't think the gold was just plating, and I very much doubted that the jewels crusting the throne's back and arm are, were, waste, were paste. I thought the king and or queen of Impis would have looked ridiculously small when perched upon it. But Hannah not only filled it, her enormous bottom squeezed out on the sides between the golden arms and the royal purple cushions. The woman, the woman on that stolen, I had no doubt of it, throne, was nightmarishly ugly. 
From where I had taken cover behind the dry fountain, it was impossible to tell how big she really was. But I'm 6'4", and it looked to me as if she'd tower over me by another five feet, even sitting down. If so, that meant Hannah would be at least 20 feet tall when standing. An authentic giant, in other words. She was wearing a circus tint of a dress and the, the same royal purple as the cushions she was sitting on. It came down to her tree trunk calves. Her fingers, each looked nearly as big as my hand, were dressed in many rings. They glimmered in the subdued daylight. If the day brightened more, they'd flash fire. Dark brown hair fell to her shoulders and onto the tidal wave of her bosom in clumpy snarls. The dress announced her as female, but otherwise it would have been hard to tell. Her face was a mass of lumps and large infected boils. A red-rimmed crack ran down the center of her forehead. One eye squinted, the other eye bulged. Her upper lip rose to her gnarled nose, revealing teeth that had been filled, filed to fangs. Worst of all, the throne was surrounded by a semicircle of bones that were almost certainly human. Radar began to cough, so I turned to her, put my head down next to hers, and looked into her eyes. Looked into her eyes is what I should say. Hush, girl, I whispered. Please be quiet. She coughed again, then fell silent. She was still shivering. I started to run away, and the coughing started again, louder than ever. I think we would have been discovered if Hannah hadn't chosen that moment to break into song. Stick a sticker, Joe, my love. Stick it where it go goes, my love. Stick a sticker all night long. Stick me with your prong de dong. Prong de dong, oh, prong de dong. Stick me with your prong de dong. I had an idea that probably wasn't what the brothers Grimm. Oh, one more time. I had an idea that probably wasn't from the brothers Grimm. She went on. It seemed to be one of those songs like 100 Bottles of Beer that was a zillion verses and that was perfectly fine with me because Radar was still coughing. I stroked her chest and belly, trying to ease her as Hannah bellowed something about Joe, my dear, and have no fear, and I half expected stick it in my rear. I was still stroking and Hannah was still bellowing when the midday bells rang. This close to the palace, they were deafening. The sound rolled away. I waited for Hannah to get up and go into her kitchen. She didn't. Instead, she pressed two fingers against her boil on her shovel-sized chin and squeezed. Out came a gusher of yellow pus. She wiped it up with the heel of her hand, examined it, slung it into the street. Then she settled back. I waited for Radar to start coughing again. She didn't, but she would. It was only a matter of time. Sing, I thought. Sing, you great ugly bitch, before my dog starts coughing again and our bones wind up with the ones you're too fucking lazy to pick up. But instead of singing, she got to her feet. It was like watching a mountain rise up. I had used a simple ratio I'd learned in math class to figure her standing height, but I'd underestimated the length of her legs. The passage between the two halves of her, ho of her house had to be 20 feet, but Hannah would have to bend to go through it. When she was on her feet, she pulled her dress out of the crack of her ass and let loose with a resounding fart that went on and on. It reminded me of the trombone break in my dad's favorite instrumental, Midnight in Moscow. I had to clap my hands over my mouth to keep from braying, from braying laughter. <laughs> not caring if it started a coughing fit or not, I buried my face in the wet fur on Radar's side and gave vent to a burst of low gasping. <laughs> I closed my eyes, waiting for Radar to start up again or for one of H Hannah's enormous hands to close around my throat and twist my head right off my neck. It didn't happen. 
So I peered around the other side of the fountain's pedestal in time to see Hannah thump her way to the right side of her house. The size of her hallucinator was hallucinatory. She could have looked up in the upstairs windows with no trouble at all. She opened the oversized door and the aroma of cooking meat came out. It smelled like roast pork, but I had a horrible feeling pork wasn't what it was. She bent down and went in. Feed me, you cockless bastard, she thundered. I be hungry. That's when you must move, Claudia had said. Something like that, anyway. I mounted the three-wheeler and pedaled for the passageway, bent over the handlebars like a guy in the last kilometer of, tour de, of the Tour de France. Before I entered it, I took a quick glance to my left, where the throne was. The cast-off bones were small, almost certainly the bones of children. There was gristle on some of, and hair on others. Looking was a mistake. Once, one I would have to take back if I could, but sometimes, all too often, we can't help ourselves, can we? Okay, all right. So, quite this was quite a little part of the chapter here. What has happened? He has come across Hannah the monster, which is, turns out to be not so much of a monster as a giant, all right? Um, as I said, since we're not really inviting people to join here, I'm not going to do too much explaining of English here. Hopefully we can understand and we'll just have a discussion here. So it looks like all that's happened is that Charlie has seen Hannah, but Hannah has not seen Charlie. He was able to take cover, as he says, which means to hide behind something so that someone else cannot, he cannot see or shoot them, right? So he took cover behind, I, I think a big stone it was, and he could get a good view of Hannah who is at least 20 feet tall, sitting in an oversized throne. But even though the throne is oversized, it was still too small for her. So her, her large, or he said enormous, butt was sort of kind of flow. The fat of her butt was flowing over the arms of the throne. It was quite disgusting, actually. So this is a huge giant, very ugly. She's got all of these boils, which as, as what we would call uh, these big heaping swells of the skin that, 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 that are filled with pus or dead white blood inside of them. And so she's got like these big, sort of like huge, large pimple-ish kind of boils that are all over her face. So she's quite disgusting. Her teeth are shaved into sort of, sort of, um, what do we call those? I can't remember what he calls them. But if she was sh shaved so that they could be sharp and easy to bite into something, uh, fangs, they're shaved into fangs, that's what they would be. And uh, it looks like her legs, he says, are like tree trunks. They're just like really thick and wide and, and, and of course, long. And longer than he had expected, actually, that, so that when she stood up, she was even taller than she expected. Uh, like he said, he had these. She had these large infected boils. Infected meaning that they were. They must have been, you know, ca causing some kind of illness that would probably kill her, right? Or it would kill someone else. But she's still alive. And of course, the bells ring. The bells ring. That that means that it's dinner time or lunch time or whatever meal time. And uh, she, it rang while she was singing this really crass song. This song, when we say that song is crass, what that means is it's not classy, it's very raunchy or in poor taste. Basically, stick me, stick a sticker, Joe, my love, stick it where my, it goes, my love. Basically, the song is talking about, you know, Joe who should stick his penis into her. And this is very, like I said, a very crass song that she's singing. Uh, and, uh, again, like a lot of old bar songs would be like that. So it seems like she's really a, a really uh, uncouth type of person or monster as it were. And so when the bells ring, he expects her to go uh, in to eat and she does, but not before crushing one of the boils on her face, squeezing it so that the pus comes out, the pus being the white blood cells or you know, uh, just a, a liquid that builds in, into sores, that, that, that fills the sores in our bodies. And it just came, came, yellowish pus came flowing out. Uh, and uh, 
and then after seeing that, she goes into the kitchen and 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 demands her dinner from whoever prepares the dinner. Someone she says is a cockless bastard or something like that. And uh, that was his time, according to Claudia, his time to now run past the entrance to this uh, toward the sundial. This is the way that he can get past her while she's eating. So he takes off to run and uh, fails to. Oh, oh, yeah. Also, before she leaves, she has a she lets loose a resounding fart. Right now, of course, resounding is a word that you may not know, but you can probably guess what it means. Resounding to resound, you can see the word sound in there, it's resound. So, you know, that, that would be like to make a sound again. So, a resounding fart would be, would be like something so loud that it echoes and seems to to occur many, many times or for a long time. It seems to echo for a long time. That's a resounding fart that went on and on, right? So she lets off this resounding fart before she goes in to eat. And this is now Charlie's chance to rush past with his three-wheeler, his tricycle, and hoping that, you know, Radar will not cough anymore because Radar's coughing almost gave him away. But of course she, she was singing, so she did not hear it. That, that was lucky for him. So now he's racing past where her throne is, takes a moment to look at the bones that surround the throne, basically the bones of humans and what he believes to be human children are now surrounding this throne of a chair. And of course, he doesn't want to look because that the memory would haunt him, but of course he could not avoid it. He had to look and that's how he went past the throne with that memory in his mind. So now let us continue on to part two. So he's gotten past Hannah. This is good. Part two. The passageway was about 80 feet long, cool and damp, lined with mossy blocks of stone. The light at the other end was brilliant. And I thought when I came out in the plaza, I might actually see the sun. But no. Just as I exited the passageway, bent over the handlebars, the clouds swallowed up the brave little patch of blue and shadeless gray returned. What I saw stopped me cold. My feet fell off the pedals and the three-wheeler coasted to a stop. I was on the edge of a great open plaza. Eight ways curved and from eight but wait, I'm sorry, one more time. Eight ways curved in from eight different directions. Once their paving had been brightly colored, green, blue, magenta, indigo, pink, red, yellow, orange. Now the colors were fading. I suppose they would eventually be as gray as everything else in Lilimar, and so much for impis beyond. Looking at those curving ways was like looking at a gigantic, once jolly pinwheel. Bordering the curving pathways were poles bedecked with pennants. Years ago, how many? They might have snapped and fluttered in breezes untainted by the scent of rot and decay. But they hung limp in dribbling rainwater. At the center of this enormous pinwheel was another butterfly statue with the wings and head destroyed. The shattered remnants were heaped around the pedestal on which it stood behind a wider way led toward the back of the palace with its three dark green spires. I could imagine the people, the impisarians, who had once filled those curving ways, merging their separate groups into one single throng, laughing and shoving good-naturedly, anticipating an impending entertainment, some carrying lunches in hampers or baskets, some stopping to buy for, from food sellers hawking their wares, Souvenirs for the little ones, pennants, of course. I, I, oh, sorry, one more, one more time. I'm going to read from souvenirs. Sorry, souvenirs for the little ones, pennants, of course. I tell you, I could see this as if I had been there myself, and why not? I had been a part of such crowds on special nights to see the White Sox, and on one never to be forgotten Sunday, the Chicago Bears, bulking above the back of the palace this part of the palace, it sprawled everywhere, I could see curved rampart of red stone. 
It was lined with tall poles, each topped with long tray-like devices. Games been, have been played there, have been played here, eagerly observed by masses of people. I was sure of it. Crowds had roared. Now the curving walkways and the main entryway were empty and as haunted as the rest of this haunted city. In our fifth grade his history mod, my class had built a castle from Lego blocks. It seemed like play rather than learning to us then, but in retrospect, it was learning after all. I still remembered most of the various architectural elements, and I saw some of them as I approached, flying buttresses, turrets, battlements, parapets, even what might have been a po postern gate. But like everything else in Lillimar, it was wrong. Staircase, staircases ran crazily and pointlessly, so far as I could tell, into and around, into and around strange toadstool-shaped extra, extra, extrances, extrasenses, which slid, slitted glassless windows. No, one more, one more time with that. Let's read that. That was a very difficult sentence. I'm going to read that again. Staircases ran crazily and pointlessly, as far as I could tell. Into a into and around strange toadstool-shaped excrescences with slitted glassless windows. They might have been guard posts. They might have been God knows what. Some of the stairways crisscrossed, reminding me of those Escher, Escher drawings where your eyes keep fooling you. I blinked, and the staircases looked upside down, blinked again, and they're right side up, and they were right side up. Worse, the entire palace, which had absolutely, which had absolutely no symmetry, seemed to be moving, like Howell's castle. I couldn't exactly see it happening because it was hard to hold the entire thing in my eyes or my mind. The stairs were in various colors, like the pinwheel paths, which probably sounds cheery, but the overall feeling was one of some unknowable sentience. And if it wasn't a palace at all, but a thinking creature with an alien brain. I knew my imagination was running away with me. No, I didn't know that. But I was very glad Mr. Bowditch's marks had brought me around to the stadium side so those cathedral windows couldn't stare to rock directly down at me. I'm not sure I could have borne their green gaze. I pedaled slowly along the wide entryway path the wheels of the trike sometimes stumping over blocks that had been pushed out of true. The back of the palace was mostly blind stone. There was a series of large red doors, eight or nine, and an ancient traffic jam of wagons, more than a few overturned and a couple smashed to pieces. It was easy to imagine Hannah doing that, maybe out of anger, maybe just for sport. I thought this was a supply area, the rich and royal saw seldom I ever... I thought this was a supply area the rich and royal saw seldom, if ever. This was the way the common folk came. I spied Mr. Bowditch's faded initials on one of the stone blocks close to its loading and unloading area. I didn't like being that close to the palace, even on its blind side, because I could almost see it moving, pulsing. The crossbar of the A pointed left so I diverted from the main way to follow the arrow. Radar was coughing again, and hard. When I put up my face against her fur to stifle my laughter, my laughter, it had been wet and cold and matted. Could dogs get pneumonia? I decided that was a stupid question. Probably any creature with lungs could get it. More initials led me to a line of six or eight flying buttresses. I could have gone under them, but chose not to. They were the same dark green as the tower windows, maybe not stone at all, but some kind of glass. Hard to believe glass could provide a, the tremendous weight-bearing load such as a huge, rearing edifice would require, but glass was what it looked like. And once again, I saw black tendrils inside, lazily writhing around each other as they slowly rose and sank. Looking at the buttresses was like looking at a line of strange green and black lava lamps. These writhing black tendrils made me think of several horror movies. Alien was one. Piranha was another. I wished I had never watched them. 
I was starting to think I was going to make a full circuit of the palace, which would mean falling under the triple gaze of those spires when I came to an alcove. It was between two windowless wings that spread apart in a V. There were benches here surrounding a little pool that was shaded by palm trees. Crazy, but true. The palms obscured what lay deeper in this alcove. But rearing above them, at least a hundred feet high, was a pole topped by a stylized sun. It had a face, and the eyes moved back and forth, like the tick-tocking eyes of a Kit-Kat clock. To the right side of the pool, Mr. Bowditch had painted his initials on a stone block. The cross crossbar of the A didn't have an arrow. This time, the arrow jutted from the apex. I could almost hear Mr. Bowditch say, what Mr. Bowditch saying, straight ahead, Charlie, and don't waste time. Okay, so that is not the end of the part, but since this is such a long part, I feel like I should just go back to there. Let's just discuss this a little bit before we move on, right? With this new tablet, there's many pages. This is only one or two paragraphs per page, so I apologize for that. I think with it from the next part, I'm going to reduce the sizing on this so that I don't have to turn the page so much. But it's good because it's easy for you to read if you are watching. I'm not going to do too much explaining of strange vocabulary. There was vocabulary here that I didn't even know, so I may have to look that up. But basically, all he's doing is describing the place that where he enters into this large plaza area that he enters with many different ways that go. Ways means like uh, many different streets or paths that lead to it and away from it. And there are countless ways that you can go from this plaza. But he's able to be guided by Mr. Bowditch's initials where he writes and with the crossbar of the A directs which way he should go. So he's able to go around and he thinks that he's going to end up going around the whole palace and back to the front of those pyres where those creepy windows were. But he does find himself in an alcove. An alcove means sort of like a, a, a small area that precedes a bigger area. So like it's sort of like a it's like a small entrance way to a larger place. If you were to go to a house and when you open the door of the house, there might be a small area where you might take off your shoes or where you might put your umbrella before you actually enter into the living room or the first room of the house. That would be like an alcove or a foyer, as, it, as it's called by the French. So yeah, this is he, he's walking into a strange alcove at this time, right? And, and there he can see Mr. Bowditch's initials, which tell him that he should go straight ahead. Right, and he is going to then go straight ahead toward this, hopefully to find the sundial. He's, he actually feels like Mr. Bodich is telling him that he should go straight ahead to find the sundial, right? So there is no reason for me to explain too much vocabulary in this because basically all he's done is just describe this area, right? And if you don't have a clear picture of what this area looks like in the in your head because you couldn't understand some words or phrases, that's fine. All we know, only we need to know is it's a big palace with many ways that you can go. There's really strange windows and staircases and things that that, that went like an Escher painting. I don't know if you know what MC I think MC Escher is his name, but the artist who makes paintings where wrote maybe stairs or paths would go into a maze-like fashion where the, nothing leads to anything and it's sort of a, a, a trick on the eyes to really try to follow anything in his painting. So he's saying this place is like an Esch Escher painting, painting. He mentioned this and I have to look this up. I don't know what it is and I'm curious. He said in this sentence, he said, staircases ran crazily and pointlessly so far as I could tell into and around strange toadstool shaped excrescences. I don't know what an excrescence is. And I am I could guess what it is. I don't, don't need to look it up. I imagine that an ex excrescence is perhaps an archway leading to a hallway or a, a room, because obviously a stairway always goes to a platform or to another room. So I'm guessing maybe that's an archway leading to another room or perhaps a level or platform. Let's look up what does excrescences mean. Yes, an excrescence is, is an, 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 an excrescence is a distinct outgrowth on a body or plant 
resulting from disease or abnormality. Okay, so that's not what I thought it was, right? Strange toadstool-shaped excrescences. They're basically <laughs> these big, I guess, sort of like cancer. <laughs> it's like a cancer that's growing on a, a, that grows on a plant. If you ever see a tree that has a cancer, it looks like it's a big woody mushroom that's coming out from it, and that's that's an excrescence. I never knew what to call that, but now I know. It's called an excrescence. It's basically a, a disease, a plant, a disease of the plant that boils out, sort of like a like a mushroom, but hard and woody, right? So. Yeah, so excrescence is that that's what it is. It's not an archway, and I didn't know what that meant. My guess was wrong, but it doesn't change my understanding of the story. So that's what's important to know about reading English. You don't need to know every word. And even if you guess the word wrongly, it probably won't cause a misunderstanding of the entire story that you're reading. So we shouldn't worry about that too much. And in that knowledge that I realize that not many people have been leaving comments, not many people have been viewing this event, and no one has attended this event, so I'm not going to waste much time explaining what much more. I mean, I could explain words like writhing, but I'll leave you to guess them. If there's no one actually watching this then or, or following along, I don't want to waste too much time. I can probably get to the, the end of this book much faster without explaining, explaining things that people don't need explained. So let's move on to the last part of part two of this chapter. Hang on, Raids. Almost there. I pedaled in the direction the arrow pointed. It took me to the right of the pretty little pool. There was no need to stop and peer into, into it from between two of the palms. But when what I'd come for was so close, but I did. One more time. I'm going to read that sentence again. Notice, <laughs> if I read it with the wrong tone or the wrong rhythm, the meaning changes. So I want to make sure I get the rhythm right so the meaning is correct. There was no need to stop and peer into it from between two of the palms. Not when I'd come for, for, for not, not when what I'd come for was so close, but I did. And as terrible as what I saw there was, I'm glad. It changed everything. Although it would be a long time before I fully understood the crucial importance of that moment, sometimes we look because we have to remember. Sometimes the most horrible things are what give us the strength. I know that now, but at the time, all I could think was, oh my dear God, it's Ariel. Lying in that pool, once perhaps a soothing blue, but now turned silty and dim with decomposition, were the remains of a mermaid, but not Ariel, the Disney princess daughter of a King Triton and Queen Athena. No, not her, most certainly not her. There was no sparkly green tail, no blue, green, no blue eyes, no billow of red hair, no cute little purple bra top either. I thought this mermaid had once been blonde, but most of her hair was, had fallen out and floated on top of the pool. Her tail might once have been green, but now it was a stupid, lifeless gray, like her skin. Her lips were gone, revealing a ring of small teeth. Her eyes were empty sockets. Yet once, she had been beautiful. I was as sure of that as I was of the happy throngs that had, come, had once come here to see games or entertainments. Beautiful and alive and full of happy, harmless magic. Once she had swum here, it had been at her, her home and the people who had taken time to come to this pocket oasis had seen her, she had seen them, and both had been refreshed. Now she was dead, with an iron shaft protruding from the, pal from the place where her fish tail became a human torso, and a coil of gray guts bulging from the hole. Only a whisper of her beauty and grace remained. She was as dead as any fish had ever died in an aquarium and floated there with all its lively colors faded. She was an ugly corpse, partially preserved by cold water, while a truly ugly creature, Hannah, still lived and sang and farted and ate her noxious food. Cursed, I thought, all cursed, evil has fallen on this unlucky land. That was not a Charlie Reed thought, but it was a true thought. I felt hate for Hannah rise up in me. 
not because she had killed the Little Mermaid. I thought the giant would have simply torn her to shreds, but because she was Hannah, uh, because she, Hannah, was alive and would be in my way going back. Radar began coughing again, so I, so hard I could hear her, the basket creak behind me. I broke the spell of that pathetic corpse and pedaled around the pool and toward the pole with the sun atop it. Okay. So while he's heading toward the pool, or heading toward the uh, the sundial, he crosses a, 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 another pool, another dark pool that's dirty and probably once was clean. And inside the pool, he sees a dead mermaid. Not exactly Ariel from the Disney's mermaid, the little mermaid, but probably someone who was a very beautiful mermaid who had been killed by someone with probably wasn't Hannah because she was killed by a big a, a pole and Hannah probably being as big as strong as she was was would probably just tear her apart. So she was she had been sort of uh, I can't remember the word, but she had been well let's say she had been pierced by a pole of and in, oh, the word is impaled. She had been impaled by some a pole and killed that way, right around the waist, where her human body turns into a fish body. Uh, so that's basically all we see there. The rest he describes describes how she has decomposed and also been been preserved by the cold pool water. And he saw that thing, and in seeing that thing, he realized how how cursed this area is, how much he want, he hates Hannah, and how much he would like to kill Hannah if he could. So he, he, this hatred is welling up in his body. And that's all that basically happened. He saw a mermaid. That's all that happened. If you couldn't understand anything else, that's fine. He just saw a dead mermaid in a pool. And then his dog, Radar, started coughing again, which reminded him of his mission. So he pedals on toward the sundial. And part three, I guess we get to the sundial. Because the first word is the sundial, right? So let's begin part three of this chapter. The sundial filled the part of the alcove where the V of the two wings narrowed. Before it was a sign on an iron pole, faded but still legible, it said, all keep out. The disc looked to be 20 feet in diameter, which made it, if my math was right, about 60 feet in circumference. I saw Mr. Bowditch's initials on the far side. I wanted a good look at them. They had guided me here. Now that I was, those last ones might tell me the right direction to turn the sundial. It wasn't possible to ride in Cla Claudia's freewheeler across because the sundial circle was rimmed with short black and white pickets about three feet high. Radar coughed, choked, and coughed some more. She was panting and shivering, one eye gummed shut, the other looking at me. Her fur was matted against her body, letting me see. Not that I wanted to, how pitifully thin she'd become, almost skeletal. I dismounted the trike and lifted her out of the basket. Her shivering against me was convulsive. Shudder and relax, shudder and relax. Soon, girl, soon. Hoping I was right, because this was her only chance, and it had worked for, for Mr. Bowditch, hadn't it? But even after the giant... But even after the giant and the mermaid, I found it hard to believe. I stepped over the pickets and walked across the sundial. It was stone and divided into 14 high wedges. Now I think I know how long the days are here, I thought. A simple symbol, worn but still recognizable, was engraved in the center of each wedge. The two moons, the sun, a fish, a bird, a pig, an ox a butterfly, a bee, a sheaf of wheat, a bundle of berries, a drop of water, a tree, a naked man, and a naked woman who was pregnant, symbols of life. And as I passed beside the high pole in the center, I could hear the click, 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 click of the eyes in the sun's face as they went back and forth, picking time away. I stepped over the short pickets on the far side, still holding radar against me. Her tongue hung limply from the side of her mouth as she coughed relentlessly. Her time had grown short indeed. 
I faced the sundial at Mr. Bowditch's initial. The crossbar of the A had been turned into a slightly curved arrow pointing to the right, which meant that when I turned the sundial, if I could, it would be moving counterclockwise. That seemed correct. I hoped so. If it was wrong, I would have come all this way just to kill my dog by making her even older. I heard whispering noises and paid them no mind. Radar was all I was thinking about, just her, and I knew what had to be done. I bent and gently laid her on the wedge engraved with a sheaf of wheat. She tried to raise her head, but couldn't. She laid it sideways on the stone between her paws, looking at me with her one good eye. Now she was too weak to cough and could only wheeze. Let this be right, and God, please let it work. I knelt and grasped one of the short rods singing the, ringing the sundial's circumference. I pulled on it with one hand, then both. Nothing happened. Radar was now making choking sounds between gra gasps of air. Her side went up and down like bellows. I pulled harder. Nothing. I thought of football practice, practice and how I'd been the only one on the team not just able to move the tackling dummy, but to knock it over. Pull, you son of a bitch! Pull for her life! I gave it everything I had. Legs, back, arms, shoulders. I could feel blood rushing up my straining neck and into my head. I was supposed to be quiet in Lilymar, but I couldn't restrain a low, growling grunt of effort. Had Mr. Bowditch been able to do this? I didn't see how. Just when I thought I still wasn't going to be able to budge it, I felt the first minuscule shift to the right. I couldn't possibly pull harder, but somehow I did. Every muscle in my arms, back and neck, standing out. The sundial began to move. Instead of being directly in front of me, my dog was now a little to my right. I shifted my weight the other way and started pushing for all I was worth. it was worth. I thought of Claudia telling me to strain my pooper. I was straining it now for sure, probably on the verge of turning the poor thing inside out. Once I had it started, the wheel turned more easily. The first picket was beyond me, so I grabbed another, shifted my weight again, and pulled on it as hard as I could. When that one slipped past, I grabbed yet another. It made me think of the play merry-go-round in Kavanaugh Park and how Bertie and I used to spin it until the little kids riding on it were screaming in joy and terror, and their mothers were yelling at us to stop before one of them flew off. Radar was a third of the way to, around, then half, then on her way back to me. The sundial was spinning easily now. Perhaps some ancient grease clog in the machinery beneath it had been broken, but I kept yanking on those pickets, now going hand over hand as if climbing a rope. I thought I was seeing a change in radar, but believed it might be only wishful thinking until the sundial brought her all the way back to me. Both of her eyes were open. She was coughing but the horrible wheezing had stopped and her head was up. The sundial moved faster and I quit pulling at the pickets. I watched Raider on a second circuit and saw her trying to rise on her front paws. Her ears were up instead of flopping dispiritedly. I squatted, breathing hard, my shirt damp against my chest and sides, trying to figure out how many turns would be enough. I realized I still didn't know how old she was. Fourteen? Maybe even 15? If each circuit equaled a year, four turns on the sundial would be good. She could put her back in prime, six would put her back in prime life, prime of life. When she passed me, I saw she wasn't just propping herself on her front legs. She was sitting up and she was, the, she, and as she came around for the third time, I saw something I could hardly credit. Rays was filling out, putting on more weight. She wasn't yet the dog who had scared the shit out of Andy Chin, but she was getting there. Only one thing bothered me. Even without me yanking on the short posts, the sundial was still picking up speed. The fourth time around, I thought Radar looked worried. The fifth time, she looked scared, and the wind of her passage blew the sweat-soaking hair, hair off my forehead. I had to get her off. 
If I didn't, I'd be treated to the sight of my dog becoming a puppy. And then, nothing. Overheard, the click, 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 click of the sun face's eyes had become click, 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 click. And I knew that if I looked up, I'd see its eyes going left and right, faster and faster, until they were just a blur. Amazing things can go through your mind in times of extreme stress. I flashed on a Turner Classic Movies Western I'd seen with my dad back in the, his drinking days. Pony Express, it was called. What I remembered was Charlton Heston galloping her, hell for leather toward a lonely outpost where a bag of mail hung on a hook. Charlton snatched it without ever slowing his horse from its all-out gallop, and I was going to have to snatch radar the same way. I didn't want to shout, so I got into a crouch and held my arms out, hoping she'd understand. When the sundial came round and she saw me, she got to her feet. The wind of the speed disc, the wind of the speeding disc rippled her fur like invisible stroking hands. If I missed her, Charlton Heston, Heston hadn't missed the mailbag, but that was a movie, I'd have to jump on myself, grab her, and jump off. I might lose one of my 17 years in the process, but sometimes desperate measures are only measures, are the only measures. As it happened, I didn't have to grab her at all. When I put her on the sundial, raids couldn't have been walked on for her, uh, couldn't have even walked on her own. After five, going on six, turns on it, she was an entirely different dog. She dropped to her haunches, flexed newly powerful back legs, and leaped into my outstretched arms. It was like being hit with a flying bag of concrete. I fell over on my back with radar over me, four paws planted wide on either side of my shoulders, wagging her tail like crazy and licking my face. Stop it, I whispered. But the command didn't have much force because I was laughing. She went on licking. At last, I sat up and took a good look at her. She had been down to 60 pounds, maybe less. Now she had to go 80 or 90. The wheezing and coughing were gone. The room drying on her snout was also gone, as if it had never been there. The white had disappeared both from her snout and the black saddle of her fur, a fur on her back. Her tail, which had been a tattered flag, was bushy and full as it, as it swished back and forth. Best of all, the surest indicator of the change the sundial had wrought were her eyes. They were no longer filmy and dazed as if she didn't know exactly what was going on or within her or, or inside, outside in the world around her. Look at you, I whispered. I had to wipe my eyes. Just look at you. Okay, so what has happened? Okay, this is the big moment, right? This is the big moment. So Charlie has done what he has come to do. He has fulfilled the first and most important part of his mission, I, I suppose. He has made it to Impis, gone to this land of Lilliput, I think it's called. I Lilliput is what I remember, but it's it's actually a different name. He's made it past the monster Hana. He's made it to the sundial. He's put his dog on the sundial. He has made the sundial to move counterclockwise, not clockwise, right? And putting his having his dog on the sock on the, on the sundial while it moved counterclockwise five times it went around which i guess took away five years of the dog's life saving the dog from death the dog is now a healthy healthy and in its prime jumps off the sundial lands on him and he has a fully restored radar in his possession again so that's basically what happened. We won't go too much into vocabulary there because the time is growing short. It doesn't look like we will be able to finish this chapter. I wasn't expecting to really, but I do want to move on to part four so we can see what happens from there. And then after that, we'll close this event and uh, we'll start again next time. So part four. I hugged her, then stood up. The thought of finding the gold pellets never crossed my mind. I tempted fate enough for one day, more than enough. There was no way this new and improved version of radar would fit in the basket on the back of the three-wheeler. One look was enough to convince me of that. Nor did I have her leash. That was back at Claudia's house in Dora's cart. I think part of me must have believed I'd never need such a thing again. I bent put my hands on the sides of her face, 
and looked into her dark brown eyes. Stay with me and be quiet. Hush, Reds. We went back the way we came, me pedaling, radar padding along beside me. I made it a point not to look in the pool. As we neared the stone passageway, the rain began again. Halfway along the passage, I stopped and dismounted the trike. I told Radar to sit and stay, moving slowly, keeping my way back to the passageway's moss-coated side. I slid to the end. Radar watched, but didn't move. Good dog. I stopped when I could see the golden arm of that grotesquely over-decorated throne. I took another step, craned my neck, and saw it was empty. Rain pattered down on the striped canopy. Where was Hannah? Which side of the two-part house? And what was she doing? Questions for which I had no answer. She might still be eating her midday meal of stuff that smelled like pork but probably wasn't, or she might have already gone back to her living quarters for her afternoon nap. I didn't think we'd been, we'd been gone long enough for me to assume she'd finished eating, but that was only a guess. The last little while, the first mermaid, then the sundial, had been intense. From where I stood, I could see the dry fountain dead ahead. I would, it would give us good cover, but only if we were unobserved until we got there. Just 50 yards, but when I imagined the consequences of being caught on, out in the open, it, sin, it seemed a lot further. I listened for Hannah's bellowing voice, louder even than Claudia's and didn't hear it. A few verses of the Prong de Dong song would have come in handy for pinpointing her location. But here's something I learned in the haunted city of Lilibar. Giants never sing when you want them to. Nevertheless, a choice had to be made, and mine was to try for the fountain. I went back to radar and was about to mount up on the trike when there was a loud slam to the left of the passageway's end. Radar started and turned that way, a low snarl beginning deep in her chest. I grabbed her before it could morph into a volley of barks and bent down. Quiet, Radar, hush! I, he I heard Hannah muttering something I, I couldn't make out, and there was another of those great ripping farts. This one didn't make me feel like laughing because she was walking slowly across the entrance to the passageway. If she looked to her right, Radar and I could stand against the wall and maybe in the dimness go unobserved. But even if Hannah were nearsighted, Claudia's three-wheeler was too big to miss. I drew Mr. Bowditch's revolver and held it by my side. If she turned our way, I was going to shoot her. And I knew exactly what I was going to aim for, that red-rimmed crack running down the center of her forehead. I'd never practiced with Mr. Bowditch's gun, or any gun, but my eyes were good. I might miss the first time, but I'd have four more chances, even if I did. And for the noise, as for the noise, I thought of those bones scattered around the throne and thought, fuck the noise. She never looked our way or toward the fountain either, only stared at her feet and went on muttering in a way that reminded me of dad before he had to make a speech at the Overland National Insurance Annual Dinner. When he won Regional Employee of the Year, there was something in her left hand, but her hip mostly blocked it until she raised it to her mouth. She was gone from sight before she could bite into it, which was fine by me. I'm pretty sure it was a foot, and that was and there were and, and that there was already a crescent-shaped bite on one side of a below the ankle ankle. I was afraid she might settle back onto the throne to polish her after lunch treat. Polish off her after lunch treat. That's what it should say. But apparently the rain, even with the canopy to shield her, discouraged that idea. Or maybe she just wanted her nap. Either way, there was the slam of another door, this one to our right. Then silence. I holstered the gun and sat down next to my dog. Even in the dimness, I could see how good Radar looked, how young and strong. I was glad. Maybe that seems like a tame word to you but it doesn't to me. I think, gladness is a, I think gladness is a big, big deal. I couldn't keep my hands off her fur and marveling at how dense it was. Okay, 
So that gets us to the end of part four of chapter, I think this is ch chapter 18 we are at. And okay, so I guess we will continue, pick up where we left off here at chapter five, a part five of the chapter next time. Uh, so what has happened in this part? Basically, he's come back to the part where he must get past Hannah, couldn't figure out where Hannah was, but then Hannah does appear, appears to be munching on a human foot you know, biting off pieces at the ankle. So this is a disgusting creature, right? Uh, as luck would have it, Hannah didn't notice him in radar as they were standing out in the open. And certainly the tricycle, which, which was out in the open because Hannah was too preoccupied with her snack and looking at her feet. And she decides not to sit on her throne, which is good. She goes into her living quarters, which gives them a chance to, to get past where she is and continue on home. Uh, at the end of this, he's just thankful that Radar is okay and glad that Radar is healthy again, amazed at how beautiful her fur is. And that's pretty much how we finish this part. And that's how we'll finish this event as well. Uh, like I said, uh, you, you will not be invited to join this event in the future because I'm just going to continue on reading. We're well past the plot line now. We've, we've reached a semi-climax to the story, if not the main climax of the story. So you know, he's, he's completed his first mission. At this point, it does not appear that anyone will join. It will be here, live stream for people to watch, but uh, I'm not going to promote it any further. So. If you come back here on Tuesdays at three o'clock, you may see me here or you may not. That won't go as it goes. Uh, however, we do continue to have our book clubs that you are invited to join our Tuesday evening book club where we are reading uh, otherwise known as Sheila the Great, which is a much easier reading uh, that, will, that won't challenge you as much. It won't challenge me as much, to be honest. Also on Wednesday evenings, Wednesday night book club, we are reading Dr. Doolittle, The Voyages of Dr. Doolittle. A little bit more challenging reading, but not quite as, bad, as hard as this one is. Although it might have a little bit more old world English. So you, you, you'll get a boost in vocabulary from reading along with us on that one. You are invited to join that privately. The live stream will continue. However, next week, um, the, this afternoon live stream and the evening book club will not will not occur. We are going to pick up again in April or the first week of April. So uh, you know, this week you know, everything's happening, but as of next week, we're going to postpone, or at least not to cancel until the, the the first week of April and be, and begin again with all book clubs, live streams, and evening book clubs and what have you. We do have some events coming up as well, so do take a take a care to check out our event calendar of last weekend's curry night at the Cimarron was a success. It was great. Thank you for members. Thank, thank you to members who could join. It was a great time. Uh, we filled ourselves up, but this time not too much, and we could have good conversation in English. That was good. And the, thanks to the staff at Cimarron who were very uh, accommodating. That was great. And that will happen again next month, of course. Uh, I think this weekend we do have the bachata, salsa bachata dance party and lesson on Saturday night. You're welcome to go there. It looks like no one has signed up as yet, so I will not be joining that. Uh, so if you can still go. Um, and, 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 and there's a host there, Ricardo. That's his party. And you can definitely still go, according to the details there. But uh, I, as a real English party host, will not be joining. Of, although if, if you do sign up with us, then I can make sure that there is another real English party host that can join you for that. Of, I will be at Norton Place because I have to fill in for one of the teachers there this Saturday. And probably I'll probably go to the dance party a little bit later after that. Of, and of course, uh, the next weekend, we have our real English party song event in Nagatsura at the Midori Art Park. Of, that's not this Saturday, but next Saturday. You're welcome to join us there. I think it's at three o'clock and I forgot what song we'll be practicing, but I find that that is almost as use useful and beneficial as the book club when it comes to you know, discussing English, learning vocabulary, learning how to use vocabulary and uh, just creating a good opportunity to use the English that you've been studying. Uh, if there's any other kind of event that you would like to have, by all means, let us know. We're happy to host any event that you would like us to host. Uh, but for now, I guess that's it. 
My hay fever has gotten a little better through this reading, but I think I do want to rest up a bit until this evening, the Tuesday evening book club. So we'll say we'll sign off for now and say goodbye and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, do take that time to join the real English party of life that's right out there waiting for you. Remember, you have to go to the English. The English will not come to you. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now.